Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, an afternoon session on the second day of the conference uh, as part of the O Grain Track, the Organic Grain Track of the Growing Stronger Collaborative Conference. I'm Erin Silva. I'm an associate professor at the University of Wisconsin Madison and the State Extension Specialist in Organic Agricultural Systems. And it's my pleasure to welcome you today to our workshop, Organic Row Crop Management and the Biology of Soil Health. We have three outstanding speakers to share information with you today, both on a broader scale with respect to understanding the biology of soil health, as well as giving some specific information on a research project that's been underway at the University of Wisconsin-Madison for the past three years. So we have joining us today, Dr. Matt Rourke, who is a professor in the Department of Soil Science and the State Extension Specialist in Soil Fertility. We have Dr. Teal Potter, who was a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and is now at Washington State University. And Miranda Sakura, who is an Associate Research Specialist in the Department of Soil Science here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So I am going to hand it right off to them. They have a lot to share and we are hoping to get a lot of questions questions from the audience. Um, if you have questions, please type them in the chat function in the Cvent app. Um, we will uh, take questions throughout. Um, we may wait till pauses between the speaker or address them at the end, but certainly as we go along, um, ask your questions in the chat. Uh, we also have some interactive questions, so be looking out for that. I will um, let you know when those questions are in the chat because we'd like to get your opinion and your thoughts on, on some issues as well. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Ruark. Thank you, Dr. Silva. So first off, um, yes, I highly encourage everyone to uh, ask questions. So we, I found that, uh, you know, these virtual formats are a little different, right? And it'll be a lot more fun with more questions that we get. So uh, overall, uh, the, the title of our presentation, Organic Row Crop Management and the Biology of Soil Health. And today we're going to cover we're gonna have three different sections. I'm gonna talk a little bit to start on just an overview of soil health and just the perspective on soil health that you know where we're coming from on it. Uh, Miranda is gonna talk about managing for soil health and organic production systems. So a little bit more specifics on management and based on some uh, on-farm survey work we've done. And then Teal is gonna get into a deeper understanding of soil microorganisms and what they do. So the overview of, of soil health. Um, and so I, I would imagine as everyone thinks about soil health, you know, everyone might have a little different take on it. And so I always like to use this slide uh, put together by my, my friend, Steve Coleman, you know, what does a soil, a healthy soil consist of, right? And I'm sure everyone on this, on this uh, Zoom meeting here can think about, you know, several things of, of how they would describe a healthy soil. Right, and so some of these might be might be have sufficient nutrients, good tilth, good workability, sufficient rooting depth, good drainage, few pathogens, but um, plenty of beneficial soil biota, low weed pressure, no harmful toxins to the crop, and resil uh, and resilience to degradation. Now you know uh, what's interesting about this is. None of this, none of these are connected to one specific measurement per se, right? So it's about healthy soil is about what we want uh, and how that what the care these bigger characteristics are of the soil. So we all I, I put this together to kind of get at what what we've done in soil health from a soil science perspective is we have devolved it a little bit into soil testing. And so you know, just starting with this idea up at the left, this fluffy definition, conception of soil health. We know soil health is good, um, but really is it about what are the specific things we want from the soil? We had that list before, but I, you know, in theory, there'd be a hundred or more things we might want from the soil, right? And maybe a better way to capture that is the idea of ecosystem services. What's that service that soil is providing? But what we really need to do, and we're gonna work over here on this side of the world, the specific soil measurements. What do we need to measure about the soil that does connect in some way to the things we want from the soil. And then also in a perfect world that uh, these specific soil measurements may connect to agronomic decision-making, meaning if you could quantify, if you could get a certain measurement of your soil, what, can you know that you're able to achieve higher yields? Uh, would you be able to reduce your nutrient inputs? Would you be able to reduce your um, 
uh, your need for uh, other inputs to manage pests and disease. Then you have this side of the world with crop management and all these crop management effects that are, that are affecting these uh, specific crop measurements or crop management effects that might be affecting the ecosystem services. So you can see there, it can get a little fuzzy in here. Um, so I wanna just make sure everyone, when we're thinking about it, we do have these things we want from the soil, but we also need to identify if, if soil, if the science of soil health is gonna advance, we need to be able to identify what we should be measuring and what would be things that we can measure in a relatively easy way. So, you know, we talk about ecosystem services. Here's another kind of big example of all these other things that, you know, we could list too. The idea of carbon sequestration, uh, flood regulation, um, uh, foundation for human infrastructure, you know, all of these different things. So it's, there's so many things, but it's hard to capture, like the idea of, is it a habitat for microorganisms? Well, what would you measure to, to know that? And you might want to measure several things. And that's the thing. So soil health is multivariate by nature. And so there's many properties uh, that can or should be measured. And we probably can't sum it up with a single number. So this is our, this is our great challenge. So many of you have probably seen these, this figure, right? We use it all the time. There's three circles and in the middle, you know, we have the physical aspects of soil, the chemical properties of soil and the biological properties of soil. And in the middle where they all intersect, that's soil health. Okay, so we have all these things and, you know, we can kind of break it down. Well, chemical properties of soil, these are well studied. They're easy to measure. Any soil test lab can tell you, you know, about, you know, extractable nutrients. They're the, they're the aspect of soils that we've been studying probably the longest. Um, people have been studying soil chemistry for well over 100 years. And we know what to do with those values. If you get a, you know, a pH measurement or soil nutrient levels, we can utilize that to, to you know, to make lime recommendations or nutrient recommendations. The physical aspects of soil, you know, things like aggregation, compaction, porosity, they're well understood. Uh, they're not necessarily easy to measure because it, it involves, you know, field evaluations, but they're often things you can see. So if you have compacted soil or you have poor, in, you know, uh, poor infiltration, that's going to be something that you're going to be able to, you know, sense about your soil. So um, we may not, you know, there, there are things that you can physically see and, and, and understand. Then it leaves us with this biological measurement of soil. And that's been the big missing piece of um, soil testing for a long time. It's not, I'm gonna say it's not well understood. It's pretty complex. It's, we can say there's certain things that are easy to measure, but it's not, we're not quite sure exactly what to measure yet. We're doing a lot of, of testing of specific measurements to kind of bring into our soil testing world. So as we think about all of these things, um, you know, connecting that function to indicator, and maybe I should have that arrow going the other way. You know, if we want to manage it, we need to be able to measure it. So if we want to measure those function, if we want to manage for those functions, we need to pick indicators. And you can see this, there's a laundry list of things here uh, for chemical, physical, and biological. And so we've got to pare down on which, which ones we're going to use. Uh, the other aspect of a good soil health indicator, um, this is from a paper put out a few years ago, and I thought they did an excellent job in terms of describing, you know, what we want. It needs to be evidence-based. So we need to have some research on it. It needs to be sensitive to changes in management, meaning that if, you know, if you're going to change a management practice, if you're going to add a management practice, if it doesn't really, it's not really affected by management, it's not going to be a good soil health indicator. It's not going to give you a sense of uh, if you're going up or down. It needs to be accurate and precise, meaning it has to have good scientific methods behind it. It needs to be cost effective, which really means it needs to be able to be conducted in a soil test lab. And um, there's certain uh, tests that are pretty expensive, probably don't fit into our soil testing lab world that easily. Um, so they're probably gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna be limited in its use. And then lastly, it has value. And that gets the idea of, can we connect it to something um, some decision-making process, right? It might even just be as simple as, did my yield potential go up? Uh, can it be connected to nutrients? Can it be connected to other decision-making for other, uh, you know, other disease or, or, or uh, uh, pest pressures? So the part that I want to kind of, kind of circle in on here is this idea that, well, most of these measurements, one of the big things we want to do is to get at this idea of a, a specific measure of organic matter. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are already getting soil organic matter by loss on ignition from soil test labs, but it might be, that might not be the best uh, indicator of soil health. 
So, cause there's different parts of the organic matter and the, how fast they cycle. So we have this idea that there's this, most of this organic matter is in this passive pool where it doesn't cycle very fast. The turnover is decades or centuries. We have another pool that's the slow pool. That's years to decades of turnover. But then we have this idea that there's this active pool of organic matter and that might be something we're interested in. So it represents recently deposited organic material with that, uh, uh, that involves a lot of rapid decomposition and cycling of carbon and nutrients. So carbon, which would be uh, available to the soil microorganisms and nutrients would be available to the organisms and the plant. So it represents, you know, can represent anywhere between 10 to 15% of the organic matter. And this is a turnover that might happen within a growing season. So this active pool of organic matter can be considered an integrator of biology and chemistry. And we're gonna talk a lot today about two specific ways we can get at that active pool. And I'm going too fast. So there's two different ways we can get at this active pool. So the first one is a, a soil incubation. And this is the idea, we're gonna let the microbes tell us what's going on. So for example, in this case, we're gonna take soil, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna incubate it at a standard temperature and moisture. In this case, we're gonna measure the carbon dioxide production over time. So meaning we're gonna uh, let the microbes uh, consume that active pool, produce CO2, and we're gonna measure that increase in CO2. So that's, that's one way to go, but it does take time. In this case, this would be a 24 hour uh, incubation. Some incubations might, might be recommended for maybe three days. So it's a, it does take some time to get that. The other idea is, is there a chemical extraction? Can we extract that active carbon pool in the same, in the same way we might extract soil tests phosphorus or potassium to get at some sort of availability. And there is, there's a, it's a permanganate oxidizable carbon, sometimes called POC-C. You might actually hear it actually called active carbon. And it's a quick method. And these extractions then can be easily conducted by soil test labs. So we have two different approaches. We've got the, uh, we have the uh, uh, incubation approach and the chemical extraction approach. Uh, so there's two uh, interesting papers that have come out recently that have talked about some of the value of these organi of organic matter and organic matter pools. So the first one on the left is this global meta-analysis on the relationship between organic matter and crop yields. And that connected uh, organic matter with corn and wheat yields. We're saying that as organic matter increases up to 4%, so do corn and wheat yields. So overall, there's a benefit to increasing organic matter and uh, especially as it's tied to production, but uh, um, but it uh, but it's it's still the uh, the big organic matter pool, right? So it, it's it's that great integrator. Now the the other paper that that has come out uh, improved soil biological health increases corn grain yield, and here we're saying roughly a twenty percent increase in soil health metrics, which include that extractable carbon and the total carbon and soil together lead to a 5% increase in yield. So all of our indicators uh, at this kind of gross scale here are indicating that as we improve soil health and, and, and build organic matter, that's gonna help our production systems. So now, now Grant, now this is very, this is a broad take on this, right? So uh, what the research you're gonna hear today is going to, is gonna get this is, we've taken a more regionalized approach to understanding that, that relationship. And then lastly, then, so those are, the, those are the simple measurements. And then the question is, is there more value uh, in more complex biological measurements? And so we, this, is, this is one of the big things we're studying in a, in a lot uh, of, of our research is, well, there are these more sophisticated measurements we can do, such as soil amplicon sequencing, that can tell us which bacteria and fungi are present. We can do soil metagenomics, so it gets at what the bacteria and fungi are capable of doing. Uh, we can also do soil meta uh, uh, transcriptomics uh, that gets to what the bacteria and fungi are actively doing. Now, uh, and so you, you might hear some of these terms a little bit later. So we have the idea of like, what are these simple measurements? Are they providing value? And then do we, is there something else we can learn by having these more biologic, uh, more complex biological measurements taken? And what can we learn from them? So as we kind of have more discussions today, so soil health, um, is a young emerging field that needs refinement. Uh, our angle that it needs soil type and region specific recommendations, and that's hopefully what we're, we're gonna demonstrate today uh, to a certain extent. 
Uh, it might need crop specific recommendations that might be, um, you know, do grain crops and vegetable crops may differ uh, in terms of, of how they're responding to soil health. Certainly we do recommend it should be evaluated over time. You know, I haven't talked about the idea of soil health as a metric, you know, is it something to see where you're going? Are you increasing, maintaining, or decreasing? And needs to be connected to all as, uh, aspects um, of, uh, of, I should say, output, which is yield and quality. So that does tie to vegetable and fruit production as well. So um, with that, uh, we do have a question um, that we'd like to pose to the group. Uh, before uh, Miranda starts to talk. And the question is, if you had funds, is, I'm gonna make sure this is the right one, if everyone's, okay. If you had funds to implement or adjust one management practice to improve soil health, what management practices would you prioritize? And uh, Dr. Silva is gonna put that up in the chat and, um, and uh, we encourage you, you all to answer. Yeah, I think I put it in the I think I put it in the live Q and A so you can see it. And what we'd like you to do, um, we were hoping to use the upvote function, but I'm not sure if that's going to work. Um, ideally, if we were live, Teal does an awesome job doing live polls as part of the presentation. But if if you can um, put one of these letters in as a question, so we can get a sense of where you might want to prioritize, that would be awesome. Kind of a fun way to to see um, what people are thinking. Um, so we'll give that a shot, trying some novel things with uh, the Q&A function. While we're waiting for that for a minute, we do have one other question in the chat. Do you want to look at that right now, Matt? Uh, the one that Aaron just posted that says, uh, um, yep. Uh, with respect to biological testing indicators, could you not start with doing biomass assessments of the soil at the root zone for major member components of the soil food web? For example, uh, F to B ratios, decomposers, symbionts, nutrient cyclers, et cetera. So, yeah. So the answer is yes. The problem is I would put those in the category of more complex measurements. Um, to get that information. And these are becoming, I mean, these are routine. Uh, I mean, these are analyses that we can do, you know, pretty easily in an academic setting, um, but are more expensive tests uh, for, um, for soil test labs to implement as of now, as of now. Um, so the, 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 big, the big struggle we have in soil health and soil health testing is that idea between uh, cost and, and benefit. So uh, there are places where you could probably get this information but it's going to be certainly a lot pricier and is not, these aren't rapid tests that can be incorporated uh, easily necessarily into soil test labs. So, and I think you're going to be able, we're going to uh, see some more discussion on those types of measurements later on. Oh, people are putting in answers all over the board, which is so interesting, as well as options under clarifying the other of grazing and improving soil texture. So this is awesome. I love the interaction here. So, so with that, and and I and I hope uh, I think uh, this is gonna be great. Hopefully, we can keep that um, all the comments coming in. So with that I'm gonna turn it over to uh, to Miranda Sakura. All right, thanks, Matt. Um, so Matt gave us a place to start in terms of thinking about what soil health is and how do we measure it and make sense of it, right? Um, we also heard from y'all about what management you'd prioritize for soil health, and apparently our list didn't encompass it at all, and of course it didn't. Um, but now we're going to delve into how to answer the questions that we want to know about biological soil. How are we, how are you doing that? So we want to know things like how do we design soil health assessments that um, give us useful information to make farm management decisions? And what management decisions should we make um, that would give us desired biological functions? Uh, well, hate to break it to y'all, but there isn't a single approach that gives us it all. As Matt said, it's pretty complicated. Um, but researchers, they're taking multiple approaches to understand what's the most important factors for biological soil health. So whether that um, is related to the cropping system, its diversity, um, what kind of management is being utilized on the farm by the farmers, and what's going on with the soil and its inhabitants. So each approach 
um, has its own strengths and weaknesses, but we'll look at three research projects that are happening in Wisconsin as case studies and some lessons learned. All right. So the three research approaches we will look at today cover a huge range in terms of how realistically they represent what would happen on a farm. The closest we can get to reality is the field survey approach. Um, so this utilizes fields on working farms compared to fields on agricultural research stations. So there's no experimental treatments or prescribed management practices implemented. It is more so a survey of management that is already happening on the farm. So with that management that's happening, we can explore and try to explain differences in soil health measurements by the different management practices happening. At the other end of the spectrum, um, we have greenhouse experiments. So greenhouses are really controlled settings. We can make sure that the crop um, growing conditions are optimal or at least not limiting so that we can look at microbial community effects and processes that are, they are performing and how that affects the crops themselves. Also in these greenhouse experiments, we can really limit external factors so that we can focus on specific questions to things like microbial community composition and the functions that they perform. So in the middle of these two are field scale and plot scale experimental trials that occur on agricultural research stations. Um, so these kinds of trials determine the effect of specific management practices or cropping systems on whatever we're interested in, in this case, biological soil health. So on one side, we have the farm fields, um, which represent um, the most realistic situation, but it's really complicated. There's a lot of factors and variation involved um, because there's so much different management and different soils on different fields. Um, but this makes them really interesting to understand and identify trends in what's happening on these farms. Um, but as I said, they're complex. There's a lot of noise to sift through uh, because of those differences. So it's hard to pinpoint um, what are the key things happening. So um, for those kinds of studies, you need a lot of fields to participate so that we can kind of mitigate that effect. Um, but in the controlled greenhouse experiments, you get rid of a lot of that noise to answer those specific questions. Um, but then we are limited to um, the kinds of questions that we can ask. So it's a smaller subset. All right, so first we're gonna look at a field survey. So remember field surveys utilize um, the differences in management already happening on working farms, um, but also has um, the field differences and soil characteristics as important characters, um, factors to identify. So um, in this case, we are interested in important factors for biological soil health. Um, field surveys don't necessarily look at change over time, but they're more so a survey of what is contributing to differences between fields and what is making those contributions. So an example of this is a SARE funded project in the Southwest Driftless area of Wisconsin that um, is down here in this Southwest corner of Wisconsin, um, worked with 16 organic grain and dairy farms. So um, we worked with them to evaluate how differences in soil characteristics, things like texture and pH, as well as management affect biological soil health. So we visited the farms in 2018 and 2019 to take soil samples at 124 fields. Um, they were taken in spring before the planting of the next cash crop. Each field was following a corn year so that we controlled for what the previous crop was trying to mitigate some of that noise. All right, so in the upper right, you see that there's a, an icon that indicates we're talking about field surveys. Um, Teal will also be presenting results on the field survey. So that's a way to let y'all know. All right, so for the study, we obtained a detailed history from the farmers of the previous five years of management. Um, so that's related to the cropping sequence and its diversity, as well as the tillage management tillage management and manure management utilized on the fields. We also got some more long-term information such as how long have the fields been organic and what was their previous use to organic. To 
To obtain data on field soil characteristics, we use the publicly available um, soil data from NRCS's web soil survey. Um, so you might have seen something like this before if you try to utilize NRCS's tool to look at your own soil. It's an online platform with location-based data um, that's from soil mapping of the United States. The information obtained from here is primarily soil factors that are outside of the farmer's control, like soil texture and its classification. Um, something we want to know is um, what soil characteristics are the most influential on biological soil health? So that soil health assessments, when you send in a sample um, to get soil health testing, um, those assessments take into account the soil differences um, that are outside of the farmer's control. So we can rate them among peers. You can get more accurate assessments. Because not all soils have the same capacity for soil health and specifically for certain functions. So we need to include these differences when we rate how well a field is doing. So is a, like a, is a field um, meeting a lesser, less than a third of its potential or is it meeting greater than two thirds of its potential? You know, those are some things we wanna know. All right, so Matt gave a little intro into some of the indicators that we measure, but we're gonna talk about four specific ones. So one of those is permanganate oxidizable carbon or POXC. Um, so this one is related to carbon, as Matt was saying, and it measures the readily available fraction of soil carbon that microbes can use as an energy source. Basically, it represents how much food do microbes have easy access to to perform their key soil functions. How much resource do they have? Um, the other method Matt was talking about is mineralizable carbon. Um, so this is a measure of that CO2 release by microbes as a result of their activity. So just like how we release CO2 when we're performing functions, we're going for a walk, we're going for a run, um, we release different amounts of CO2 the harder we work. Um, all right. We also measured autoclave citrate extractable protein. Um, so this is soil protein and that's the largest nitrogen fraction of soil organic matter in the soil. And that fraction, the microbes, they can convert that via decomposition to plant available forms of nitrogen. So it represents bioavailable nitrogen that might be crop available. While another measure we use is potentially mineralizable nitrogen. So this measures the rate by which microbes convert um, that organic form of nitrogen to plant available forms. So also getting at bioavailable nitrogen, but asking more so how fast are microbes able to turn over that nitrogen. So this gives us some information in terms of um, some biological soil fertility, as well as carbon dynamics happening in the soil. How are we moving towards soil organic matter? All right, um, we're now gonna look at a snapshot of the management that's happening on these fields. So in this management um, is only what was happening in the previous five years before the samples were taken. So a lot of the farmers were utilizing management practices that aim at preventing soil erosion, limiting soil disturbance, and overall improving soil health. Um, and you know, it might be performing more multiple functions like that, like providing nitrogen. So 79% of the fields had a perennial crop within the last five years, and that was primarily alfalfa. So both providing perennial cover and nitrogen biologically. 76% um, of fields had perennial legume cover and 20% had annual legume cover. Also, you might notice here that um, the fields were pretty split in their cover crop use. So a little over 50% of the fields had cover, a winter cover crop. Less than 20% of the fields utilize minimum tillage over the five-year period, which we defined as a disc implement or a shallower tillage implement. Um, and you also see that about 20% of fields had at least one year of no-till um, within the five years. And most of the fields applied manure, so that was one of the things that was pretty consistent between fields. But overall, you see that there's a lot of different management practices happening on these fields. But does this lead to measurable soil health differences? Does it tell us something about management? We're gonna look at a subset of management practice data to tell the overall story. 
So over the five-year period, the number of years of legume cover, perennial cover, or a winter cover crop did not produce a measurable effect on these four biological measurements that we measured. The number of manure applications didn't have an effect either. But what about some other practices? It did identify a few management practices, but all of the effects were small. So the biggest relationship identified was with crop diversity. So as crop diversity increased, POXI, PMN, and ACE increased. However, at most, it explained less than 6% of the differences um, in soil health measurements between fields. Um, and that is seen by these R squared values. Um, you can measure, like, take these R squared values, times them by 100, and that basically tells you the percent that um, the number of different crops is able to explain in these POXI values. So what you're seeing is that less than 6% of POXI, um, differences in POXI is explained by crop diversity. So there's this leftover 94% that is from other factors such as soil characteristics and management. Um, you can also see that how long a field has been certified organic um, had small effects. So POXI as, um, as the length that they've been certified organic increased, POXI increased and ACE increased, but it was very small. So uh, these small effects, you know, they're, they're a bit disheartening, um, but let's look at this a little bit more in detail. So we're gonna focus in on that duration of organic management piece to kind of think on this more. So in this study, um, farms, they ranged from being in transition to organic to having over 27 years of organic management. So that's quite a long range. Even with this long range, um, less than 4% of differences in soil health values, um, this case, POXI and ACE, um, were explained by how long they've been organic. So there's a leftover 96%. Again, that is explained more so by um, other factors such as soil characteristics and other management practices that are happening on the farm. Um, farms are really complex systems and they're managed differently for a number of reasons. Um, so there is more variation captured on working fields than in regimented experimental trials. Um, although I don't think, you know, there's still an important message here, right? Um, the important message is that management practices and soil characteristics are more critical than time. There's some young fields that have really high um, biological soil health, and there's some older fields with low um, biological soil health. So understanding which management practices contribute the most to the high soil health values is really critical into um, improving biological soil health. Um, to make things a little bit more complicated, um, something we should remember is that not all soils have the same soil health potential regardless of management. This is due to soil properties that are outside of the farmer's control. For example, all soils, soils formed under historical prairie cover have higher soil organic matter than several other common Wisconsin soils um, used for agricultural production. And this is due to the long-term contributions of that prairie's root system turning over those roots and um, leaving behind soil organic matter. So soil health assessments need to account for these differences in soil health potential to properly rate current field soil health values. Um, using the publicly available soil data, we found that the US soil classification system was useful for explaining differences in soil health values. This is important as we can separate soils into different groups by their classification to rate their soil health according to their true potential. So on the screen is a map of the classifications represented in the study we're talking about in the Driftless region. So of the 124 fields in the study, the soils, there's about, I think, five soil classifications represented in the study, and that makes up a majority of the acreage in the Driftless area. Um, so basically, we have a study with really well represented soils of the Driftless region. So that suggests that we can use these soil classifications for benchmarking soil health in this region. 
Okay, um, so that was talking about um, on-farm studies. Now we're gonna transition to experimental plot trials with a focus on long-term research trials. So this utilizes field scale and plot scale experiments with replicated plots. So repeated areas with the same management. And it looks at the effect of management over time. In Arlington, Wisconsin, there's a long-term research trial known as the Wisconsin Integrated Cropping Systems Trial or WICST. Um, and it was established in 1989. So there's over 31 years of data um, of how this management has affected the soil that's there and other qualities. So this trial um, specifically, its purpose is to evaluate the productivity, profitability, and environmental impact of organic and conventional agricultural practices in the upper Midwest. The plots, they're about three quarters of an acre size. So they're trying to get near um, to that field scale size to better represent the reality of what would happen on a farm. Now going into what the cropping systems are, there were six common cropping systems of the upper Midwest chosen to look at their long-term effects. So the first three in the top row, we have um, cash grain systems. So this is continuous corn, a corn soybean rotation with minimum tillage and an organic cash grain system, which has corn, soybeans to wheat and red clover. Um, so the bottom three represent dairy forage systems. So we have a conventional system that goes from corn to three years of alfalfa, or organic forage system that goes from corn to an oats nursing crop with alfalfa and one more year of alfalfa. And then the last one is a highly managed rotationally grazed pasture. So um, the cash grain systems and dairy forage systems, they differ in their inclusion of perennials. So with dairy forage systems, there's more perennials represented. The inclusion of perennials also inherently reduces disturbance. So these broad categories differ in these two ways. You can also see that, especially for the cash grain systems, that there's a gradient in crop diversity. So we're able to ask questions about that as well. Um, for both the cash grain and the dairy forage systems, there's an organic system represented. So we're able to ask questions about organic and conventional management. So here's a snapshot looking at year 27 of this project. So in the 27th year, um, we have PMN, mineralizable carbon and pox C measure, these biological soil health indicators. And what was found out is that the dairy forage systems had the highest biological soil health values. Um, and primarily the rotationally grazed pasture had the highest out of all of these cropping systems. So the rotationally grazed pasture is a much different system than the others as it has continuous living cover with no disturbance. Um, the living mat protects the soil and the roots are constantly sloughing off. Um, and that material, that root is fueling the soil system. Um, so the other cropping systems that had higher biological soil health, the um, dairy forage systems, they had more perennial cover. So also less disturbance um, and more living roots presented, represented. Uh, yeah, so specifically these dairy forage systems, they had more of that active carbon pool, that carbon source of food, food for microbes. Um, they had higher microbial activity and they had a higher rate of converting that um, organic nitrogen to plant available forms. So the organic systems did not um, have better biological soil health um, than the conventional systems within those bins of cash grain and dairy forage. Um, yeah, but the experimental trial was able to um, capture this effect of perennial cover, which wasn't previously found in the on-farm study. Um, so that these experimental trials are able to get rid of some of that noise that we see on farm studies um, to like capture um, more management practices. And that's something we saw here. Miranda, it looks like there was one question about whether you have any plots in the Green Bay or Fox River Valley areas. This study did not. It was specifically looking in the driftless area to kind of 
so we have the effect of different soil characteristics to like look at that, but also we didn't want to have super different soils. So we kind of limited it that way. But I know that maybe Matt can talk about this later, that there's been a wider um, study all over Wisconsin and somewhat in Minnesota, um, but that's mostly focused on conventional systems. So if that's of interest, we can talk about that um, maybe later. All right, there's a couple other questions coming in. Um, if there can be more information about the specific practices on farms, um, specifically if the, we can give the names, which maybe we can't give the names, but maybe at least specific practices, particularly if there's any doing rotational grazing. I think as these were, I think all pretty much, not all, but most organic dairy farms that many of them would have had rotational grazing as part of their management. Yeah, that's right. So a lot of them are organic dairy. Um, so they did have pastures, um, but we didn't sample from them. We were more focused on um, these organic row crop systems and how those specific fields were rotating. But there was um, a field or there's multiple fields that was transitioned from a conventional pasture system to an organic grain system and those fields, um, it's been like 10 years since they were that conventional pasture system, but they had higher biological soil health values just because they were a pasture. Um, at least that's my interpretation of it. It wasn't many fields, but um, yeah. Thanks Miranda. And there's another question and, and Matt, I don't know if you wanna chime in on this one too from other studies that you have done with um, at Wixt, but there is a, a clarifying question as to the, the, da the Wix data that the chemicals that were applied in the conventional forage system versus the organic didn't seem to be impacting soil health in a negative way. Um, in, in terms of the indicators that we've measured, right? So in terms of the, of the thing, so, you know, what, the so I guess that that is correct. So we didn't see a difference in in our the conventional system. There is one year of corn with three years of alfalfa, versus uh, the organic system is one year of corn with uh, two years of alfalfa. <clears throat> so it's a longer set of <clears throat> perennialization. Um, and those sort of factors kind of work out. The biggest differences tended to be from cropping system, right? So going from the grain cropping systems to those cropping systems. So the nuance of it, uh, we couldn't we couldn't pull out. So um, it seemed to be the broader carbon input and soil disturbance and manure input effects that were the, had the biggest uh, benefit in terms of the, the simple biological health indicators. Does that make sense? And Teal mentioned that she's gonna talk a little bit about that too. Um, so another question uh, related to Wixt, uh, the forage systems appear to give better soil health numbers, but how significant are those differences? Um, how significant, <laughs> uh, it, right. What is, you know, I'm sorry. What does significant mean, right? So does it mean that it's, um, they were statistically significant. Do they matter? You know, what do they connect to um, in terms of any of these ecosystem services? I don't know. I don't know um, those sort of, uh, that sort of stuff. We don't have that quite connected. Um, that's not a very satisfying answer. I know the uh, what the, the the I know it just gets into such a a goofy little trick of this is you know one location and it's very soil specific right if you're already working on a nice deep mollusol soil that you can kind of beat the heck out of you know maybe it's just these broader shifts and these subtle shifts don't really don't really matter but even the even our biological health in our uh, grain systems was still probably pretty good um, so. What does it connect to? Um, I don't. Uh, I don't have a good answer for that. I'm sorry. Well, that, that relates to another question, Matt. That's kind of along those same lines. 
what is the soil type on the Arlington farm? And do you think the results would have been the same comparatively on the boon sand of the uh, person asking the question? Uh, so the, the, what are one of our goals, you know, one of Miranda's goals and one of our goals for our other soil health projects is to create these baseline measurements because, you know, obviously as Miranda showed, there's so much inherent, the inherent properties of soil do have a, so this controlling factor on, on your, your baseline soil health measurement. So it really, uh, I would pare it down to even like Miranda's work is some of the best on the subject because it's so geographically and so soil um, specific focused. Um, yes, in general, sandy soils will have lower soil health values than, uh, you know, silt loam prairie derived soils. So as we think about how are we splitting these out in terms of what a baseline, what's an expected value, and then within each soil texture, uh, soil classification system, how much can you influence it based on, based on measurement? And then at the end of the day, what does it connect to? And so we have all of these things that, you know, I talked about up front that we're still, we are still scratching the surface on it. So right now we have a pretty good handle on the, the relative importance of inherent properties versus management properties and which direction these management properties or the management might affect soil health. Um, and generally speaking, it fits, the, it fits the general narrative, more carbon inputs, less soil disturbance, um, although not all those um, necessarily are, um, were found significant in, in Miranda's work. But then the trick is, what does it mean? What does it mean for your cropping system to, to do this? Um, and is that something you'd want to manage for? Or are you just, do you just want to manage because reducing tillage means reducing, you know, fuel costs? and reduces, and we know it reduces, uh, you know, soil disturbance and, and improves the soil. So uh, this is, I know it becomes a bit of a circular argument, but that's really kind of where we're at. We're, we haven't fully connected all of these, these measurements, the soil health measurements to uh, some sort of benefit where you talk about those, if you want to talk about if it's significance, is a significant difference for what? And ideally it'd be, in my mind, one of the big ones would be for plant health and plant production. Um, there's a couple questions related to soil testing, um, both, you know, how useful the usual soil tests are for the average organic farmer that maybe they're, they're not very helpful. Um, do you have a specific recommendation for soil tests and how often um, an average organic rotation with alfalfa, corn, soy, and clover should soil test? and specific, not only in terms of what tests, but are there, what are the best soil test labs um, in Michigan was specifically recommended. So what's the ideal panel of indicators? What should people test for? Um, how often should they test? What labs should they send to? Maybe we should have you give another talk, Matt, specifically on, on that. That's Man, all I don't know all the questions. Michigan soil test labs. I mean, I would always recommend, you know, I was just like a routine test, test your nutrient levels, you know, I think testing over time, I think is really where the real value is for a lot of, uh, a lot of this. So having, you know, in general, we recommend sampling every four years, but you know, sampling every other year might be good. The more data you can build and then graph that across time, which direction are you going with your nutrient levels in your soil, with your organic matter and um, any soil biological tests. So I, a lot of these soil biological tests are being incorporated into different soil test labs. So you might be able to find some test labs that are doing something. I kind of like it, especially if you're just sort of looking at stuff over time. Again, you know, I said we don't know exactly what to do with that number. There's some labs that might want to connect it to nutrient availability. Eh, I don't know. I'm, I, I, don't know I, I don't have any data to support that. But I do like the idea of using that to monitor it over time. Um, and I think sometimes in today's world, I really honestly think with all these climate extremes we're facing, I think maintaining soil health is still as big of a win as increasing soil health. So everything, anything we can do to, to not further be reducing soil health, I think that's the, a win for us. So if you, can be in, if you can increase, that's great. But even to know you are maintaining soil health uh, with, your, with your cropping system and management practices is a good thing to know. 
Well, there's some more questions, but I think that some of these might relate to what Teal's going to talk about. So what I think I'll do is hold off on the questions. Please keep typing in questions though. These are great questions. Um, but I think I'm gonna um, hold off, have Teal present her information. Cause again, I think it will inform some of these other questions and then we can go back to the Q and A from there. Sounds good. So can you see my screen? Are we good? All right, um, so I'm Teal. I have been working on some of the da same data sets as Miranda. So you'll see those icons in the corner of my slides as well. Um, but I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the biological component of soil health and getting into the details of what we, we are trying to answer some of these questions of how does this living component of the soil connect to these soil health indicators that we know are sensitive to management, know have you know pretty inexpensive ways to measure, but we still have a lot to do, like Matt was saying, to connect this in and find out what is the useful information that we need um, moving forward. So, you know, we, we do, microbes are important. They're the ones processing, decomposing the organic matter in the soil to make it available for plants and also storing it in carbon. So we do wanna use our microbes to, um, the, and make their function stronger. So for reasons like disease pressure, um, reducing chemical inputs, helping get maximum yields in our fields. And um, it is pretty complicated as I know you've heard, but I'm gonna show you some of my research to illustrate this. So, and there are microbes and other biota that can contribute to a lot of different functions in the soil. So in contributing to soil health, disease suppression, plant drought resistance, plant nutrient acquisition, carbon sequestration, nutrient mineralization. So making those carbon and nitrogen, phosphorus available to the plants and water use. Um, these are some of the functions we're talking about when we're thinking about the microbial component. And a lot of what you may hear of, a lot of the products that you see that are microbial focused, are focused on microbes that have specific relationships with the plants. Um, so you've probably heard about mycorrhizal fungi, which trade plants, plant roots, carb, they trade nitrogen, phosphorus, um, water for carbon. Um, saprophotrophs are taking nutrients from plants. Rhizobia, these are bacteria that nit uh, fix nitrogen for plants, some plants. Uh, endophytes are microbes. There's a bunch of microbes that live in plant tissues. And then pathogens. You know, we got to remember that pathogens are microbes too. They're part of this microbial microbiome in your soils. They're fungi and bacteria. So we're thinking, I'm thinking about all these symbionts that have specific relationships with plants. Um, but then there's a lot that's going on for mediating how they mediate plant responses. And so for an example, we think of mycorrhizal, mycorrhizal fungi um, as this great mutualist. So plants benefiting, microbes are benefiting, they're trading nutrients, but in certain conditions, if the plant doesn't need those nutrients, say phosphorus, the microbe is, and the microbes are still attached, they can steal carbon from the plant. So we do need to understand this microbiome better because it's not as simple as mycorrhizae are good for your plants, right? They can start stealing your plant's carbon. And what I'm most interested in is thinking about this whole context. Most of these microbes are not symbionts. They are free living microbes that are in the soil. They might be associated with plant roots in that they're they're getting nutrients that those plant roots are secreting into the soil, um, but they might not be pathogens or mutualists. And they are competing with plants and competing with pathogens for nutrients in the soil. So um, taking the big picture view is important, but it, it makes it really complicated when we know that there's you know, more than 10,000 species in a single teaspoon of soil. 
So I'll show you how we're getting at some of this com complexity and trying to distill it down. And you know, we do know that there is lots of evidence that farming practices can impact soil biology. So this is important to know. There's a lot of studies, tons of studies that have shown this, but it's not always. And the responses vary by soil type and climate. And the responses are not always huge, not even usually huge. So there's um, a lot of reasons to focus on a small area. Um, but it is important to know in a specific area whether management practices do have consistent effects on the biology within a region uh, before we ask, does it matter, right? Go to that next step. And so going to our, our field survey, you can see the icon in the corner that Miranda talked about. Um, we asked how does organic farming change soils over time and um, to do this, we use these fields that had been under organic management for different lengths of time. Um, and we measured, does this change soil health indicators? You know, what I'm interested in taking this a step further is can we measure differences in the biological community, the living communities? And we did this with um, all these fields from across all these farms. And because there's a lot of noise um, differences among farms and soil types, um, we did needed a lot of samples. So the question here is, you know, no one's done this before, just seeing whether organic farming has a consistent effect on microbes um, before we can ask, you know, what are they doing? Is it helping us? And we don't know if that's a consistent increase, they just keep going up, or if it plateaus after a certain number of years, or maybe it goes up and goes down. We need to explore this. And so this is what we did um, on 124 field samples to hopefully see some pattern among the noise. And here's the data right here. So also with biology, consistent with some of the measurements or the measurements that Miranda told you about, um, we just see no pattern. Um, and there, so there could be high fungal species for just one example. We measured biomass, we measured um, this for bacteria as well. Um, but there's a lot going on here, right? So there was probably tillage in the past history and there's tillage still happening on organic farms. Um, the manure inputs are variable among the farms. Um, your rotations, a lot of these farms are doing similar crop rotations, but different sequences. Um, and so what to me, this tells me one thing that's definitely different is whatever pesticides or whatever non-organic certified inputs, those do not seem to have a consistent effect. Either those are breaking down pretty rapidly um, and we're not detecting that early on, or um, you know, there's a lot of microbes out there. That's what I'm always thinking about. Um, so there's a lot more that is being influenced at the field scale than specific um, certified organic management practices. So this is interesting and also brings to the point that um, these long-term field studies are really helpful to seeing like within a region and very precise consistent management can we see effects so we can understand when those when those might be important and what is driving it. Um, interestingly this paper just came out this year that shows uh, inconsistent effects of agriculture practices on soil fungi fungal communities across 12 European long-term experiments um, and a lot of these have been going for over a hundred years. So this is in Belgium, UK, uh, Hungary, and Denmark. And you can see that just on these outer um, Venn diagram loops, there's pretty high, highly different numbers. In the UK, they had 124 fungal species, and in Hungary, they had 878, right? So determining whether that matters probably is something you'd want to focus on within your cropping system and thinking about how it changes over time because we see this variability. So with that, I'm going to share a little bit what I found from the long-term um, 
trial that Miranda also talked about, looking at the biological components um, from that system, the Wisconsin Integrated Cropping System trial. And we measured, it took samples from five of the six cropping systems that are represented um, of the region. And we did also find a lot of Miranda's um, work showed that there is differences in POC-C and a lot of these indicators. And we also found that among these cropping systems, there were significant differences in um, the continuous corn, especially between continuous corn, the most of the two extremes, continuous corn and pasture. We also saw this for biomass. So we didn't see it for bacteria that was significant differences, but for biomass, we saw the same pattern for fungi and bacteria, lowest biomass, microbial biomass in continuous corn, similar um, for the organic cash grain system and quite a bit higher. But we had some questions for Matt early on that is really important to address. You know, what, what do these measure, what do these differences mean? How much change is meaningful? So we're comparing our pasture um, versus corn, we can ask, well, what can 68 additional species do for us, right? And that is too broad a question for a scientist to do anything with. We have to focus in a little bit. So maybe we could ask, does 68 additional species increase organic matter decomposition? And another thing to note here is we're talking about, you know, 68 species. That's, I don't know how to think about that. So I don't know if you can think about that in a, in a useful way, but we are talking about 68 species in a quarter of a gram of soil, right? It's, it's very small scale what we're able to measure um, in the lab. So these are super diverse systems. I just wanted to make that note because uh, that's what we're talking about. Um, so to answer this question, um, ecologists think that about this two different ways. How, what does increased species diversity mean? What could it mean functionally? Well, the, one of the predominant ways in which we think about that is more species means more types of microbial metabolisms, um, oops, which means more efficient decomposition. You have microbes that are decomposers, and I had a question about that. There are so many different types of decomposers. There's decomposers that focus on lignin, on cellulose, on proteins, on tons of different things. So if you have more different types of metabolisms, you might get corn stalks turned into, um, you know, salvaging that little bit of nitrogen in them, or at least feeding the microbes more efficiently. The other main hypothesis is um, that more species, if you have more species, you're in a huge pool of species, you're more likely to have a few that are really good at whatever you want to decompose or whatever your function is. So along with the other soil health indicators, there's this general thinking that more is better and, but here for microbes, here's the thinking behind it. And these are things that we can test. And I'll show you a little bit, but I'm gonna briefly um, bring this back to biomass. So in this case, the question might be, you know, does this difference matter? And probably most of you are not, you know, you wanna grow cash crops. So maybe your question is not, how much better is it if I don't till at all and I just have pasture? Your question might be, if I change my practices a little bit and I want to grow corn organically, does 19 millimoles more of biomass or 38% millimoles of microbial cells, what can that do for us? To focus that in, maybe your question might be, does a difference in six millimoles matter for long-term carbon storage? Well, interestingly, the hypothesis here is that more biomass actually does contribute more stable carbon for long-term carbon storage. And this is something that I didn't appreciate um, much until recently, but there is a lot of great science happening recently 
that has been showing that a huge contributor to stable carbon in soils is actually the cell walls of microbe bodies. So dead, more microbes means more dead microbes that are actually recalcitrant forms of carbon in the soil that don't break down easily. So I think that's pretty interesting that we're finding that um, they break down less quickly than most plant, um, plant tissues. So I, I do want to follow up with this. You know, I asked this question, is an increase better? Can we detect a difference in something we might be interested in? So we actually did this study in the greenhouse, which is pretty rare, but um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that study now. So for this study, um, we're interested in, you know, how does soil management affect soil microbes? And then bringing that back to something we're interested in like plant yields, crop yields. So we went back to some of the fields that we uh, surveyed in the field survey study and collected soils from them. And we used them in a greenhouse experiment. And this can allow us to ask this more specific question, right? Because we can get all these soil microbes from different places in a controlled setting and test their function. So the question here was, do soil, micro soil microbial communities from different farms influence crop growth differently? And we really are interested in whether they affect crop growth differently, but to really see this, we wanted to give the microbes a functional test. This might not be enough to detect anything. So what we, do, we did is we give them different forms of organic forms of nitrogen and urea and see if the microbes can decompose these organic sources of nitrogen differently. So we added the same amount of nitrogen, um, even though it was different amounts of biomass. And we wouldn't expect to see differences in urea because well, the microbes don't need to decompose that at all. Um, that is readily available for plants to take up. But these other ones, we thought we might see some differences. So here, I'm gonna share a quick video. Um, this is a 40 second video on this, the, the methods of this greenhouse setup. So this is showing we went out to the fields, collected soils, we sterilized soil for the background soil in the pots from a local soil, added that to the back of the pots, the 95% of the volume, added live soil as 5% of the pots, so from the different farms. And then on top of that, we added an equal amount of nitrogen in the forms of urea, manure, clover, and sorghum sudan grass. And then we had the microbes decompose that um, and then the corn was at a V4 stage. We harvested the experiment and dried the plants and weighed the plants. So that was a very quick method section there. And as we expected, we didn't see that different communities, microbial communities from different farms, we didn't see any effect on plant growth, on corn or rye growth if, um, in the urea addition pots. We, in, interesting, we also did not see any differences among the farms for clover and manure, which had a similar carbon to nitrogen ratio. But we did see that it mattered which microbes, um, some microbial communities allowed for more corn and rye growth. And so how we are thinking about that is that you actually might need more complex or more diverse microbial communities to efficiently break down the lignin, the cellulose, um, this tougher um, form of nitrogen to make that available to the plants. And some communities might do that better. Um, perhaps that is related to management and what those fields were receiving recently. I haven't looked at that to see if we can detect that. So wrapping it up here, um, we can say that soil biology does matter. These processes are done by soil microbes, um, but biology is persistent. If you're in the Midwest, you have a ton of microbes in your soil, so we're really interested in um, detecting small changes and thinking about um, 
small changes, I think. That's my personal perspective. Um, I do think that understanding biology better may be able to help us understand soil health indicators better. Um, but I think a, a take home I would like to say is that we're not at a point where we can give specific advice on how to manage your microbial community to get these benefits, but the best practices we have for soil health are likely to help your microbes. So if you're having your fields covered more, um, doing minimal tillage as possible, um, doing things to build sort so, uh, organic material in your um, fields, those are things that feed the microbial communities, right? So more diversity and more biomass on your fields is going to get you more microbes and more diverse microbes. So I think that's kind of where we're at. Happy to answer some questions. Thanks, Teal. Um, and related to that last point, um, there was a question. Um, is, is there, either through your work or through other work that you know, an inverse correlation between the amount of tillage and the amount of fungi, um, hearing that tillage is bad for fungal communities and maybe related to that, um, and again, that this may not be measured in this study, but maybe from other literature, if you do have tillage, how fast, quickly do those fungal communities recover? How bad is tillage? <laughs> That is a great question. Um, I'm actually starting some new work in a new postdoc position that's going to be tilling up some fields that haven't been tilled in 10 years to see if we can measure that on a fine, uh, finer scale. There's been some work on it and in general the thinking among the, the science we do have is that um, you know, tillage does decrease fungal biomass. Um, it, it has maybe slight negative effects on diversity, but there is enough variation among the studies that um, it's, it's not super consistent. Um, how fast it happens? So I do, th that is a great question on recovery. That's exactly what we're going to test and do these fine scale measurements over short periods of time to try and track that recovery. Um, the thinking behind the fungi specifically is that the fungal bodies are these networks of mycelium, of hyphae, and so the tillage breaks them up and parts will not recover very super quickly, as opposed to bacteria which are so tiny that um, that their, their bodies are not going to get broken up by tillage. Um, but I would say that from what I'm seeing that fungi diversity actually does recover decently well. Um, after one, one tillage event. That's about all I have for that. <laughs> if maybe if you could expand on that a little bit more, Teal, um, talking more generally about, you know, as you get an estimate of the fungal biomass, how does like general fungal activity differ from AMF specifically in its function in the soil? Um, AMF being a symbiont that we know helps with phosphorus acquisition, water acquisition, but uh, more of the function of fungal and the fungal activity more broadly in the, the, the soil community. Yeah, so the mycorrhizal fungal species, those are dependent on the plant for their carbon. So that's the main difference is that the fungi in the soil, they have a different metabolism and that they get carbon from breaking down organic matter, some type of organic matter, just like a lot of the bacteria do. And so the symbiont, you can measure, you know, actually something that's interesting with mycorrhizal fungi, our DNA, I st I, the techniques I use are these DNA sequencing techniques to get a snapshot of everybody in the community. And those are actually biased against the mycorrhizal fungi. So I can, I do not feel comfortable looking at my data set and saying what, how mycorrhizae are doing. Um, that is a case where you probably want to go look at the roots themselves and do it that way, which is um, not easy. You know, it, that is a pretty hard method to do well. But 
just thinking broadly, the, the fungi, I think of fungi, the free living fungi in the soil, similarly to what I do as bacteria. They're doing a lot of the similar um, decomposition functions and um, are competing with bacteria and plants for some of those nutrients. Thanks, Teal. And this question, maybe it relates, and this could go to any of you with respect to enhancing soil aggregation through practices, but the question relates to um, armoring the soil against extreme rainfall events. Obviously more perennials fare better, but what else can we do differently in grain systems? No takers on that? Well, okay, so <laughs> just collecting my thoughts here, but I'm happy, yeah, if, if anyone else wants to chime in too, but I think, so this just gives me an opportunity to delve into some soil science really deep discussion. So the idea of how water is held into soils is driven by the texture of the soil, right? We all know that, right? Sandier soils don't hold on to as much, but also about the idea of the aggregation and the soil aggregate. So soil, soil that has less disturbance over time is going to be able to build more aggregates and then, um, and then be able to hold on to water um, between aggregates. You know, if you have these stable aggregates, then it's going to create a better environment. So, so anything you can do, um, you know, in grain systems. So there's the trick to building aggregates is reduce disturbance, but we also need to um, bring in more organic matter as well to help basically be the, uh, you know, to build organic matter. Let me, phrase, let me rephrase it. The idea of building more organic matter that's going to be stable and, and, may, and stay in your soil is the idea of you're, you're adding carbon to your soil, but you're keeping it there in that stable aggregate form. So generally speaking, building soil organic matter connects to that process. So then in grain systems, you got to figure out a way to get more organic matter inputs into our grain systems, right? So dairy systems um, have a little bit of a leg up, more root biomass from perennials. We do have manure inputs, maybe more opportunities for cover crop use. If it's, if it's corn and soybean focused, we don't we lose a little bit of our ability there? So um, if we have some small grains in rotation, that gives us some um, that gives us more opportunities to get cover crops. So it's about thinking about your overall system and all their, the crops they have in rotation. How can you, are there places where you can add carbon into your soil through manure or cover crops really um, based on your cropping system? It is a great, it is a big challenge for us in, in our organic grain systems. And that's a great segue for this next question, um, which I think is a really good question to answer in the next 10 minutes, or at least give some perspective, um, which you just mentioned there, Matt, intensifying cover crops and adding biomass to the soil. Um, but generally from this work that Miranda Teal described, if you had to distill down some suggestions of how this work might help inform farmers to make decisions with respect to enhancing their soil health and their, their soil, biological soil health, what would be some practice recommendations that you might make? Uh, sorry, can you, can you repeat that? Um, so from this work, if you were going to advise farmers what changes and practices that they might implement on their farms to enhance soil health and soil biology, what would you recommend? And you had mentioned intensifying cover crops and adding biomass into the soil, but suggestions like that. Well, the, the joke I like to make is the best way to increase your soil health is to start a dairy, All right? So, um, cause there you're going to have opportunities to use your perennials and, and manures. Um, I, I, I don't know if I have a, a good answer to that question, Aaron. I think that we have these big shifts, you know, in inherent soil health among soil types, for lack of a better term. And we have these shifts between basically farm operations, grain, annual grain-based operations versus uh, perhaps animal agriculture-based systems that have some level of perenniality to them. Um, that's not that's not a very good answer. The, otherwise, it, it everything then devolves into really. I think I think all of the work that we've presented today does support these the general push of of reducing uh, reducing soil disturbance 
and keeping the soil covered and increasing the carbon inputs into soil. So what does that look like? I, I don't know if there's a, I don't have a general, rec, I don't have a general recommendation for that. You know, usually, and I would probably guess the same thing for Miranda and Teal and even you, right? When you, uh, thinking about different farm operations and chatting with different people, everyone has a slightly different uh, approach to management. So figuring out how it works, but working within those uh, processes, working within those, I don't know, uh, principles. Yeah. So key, this is not too much different from the five soil health principles, right? So keeping the soil covered, adding, maximizing carbon additions back into the soil and reducing soil disturbance. You know, and I was, I was, yes. And so, and I was always uh, not skeptical, but because those, we, we generally think that's true. It's just like, ah, are the, you know, these are general things. How true are they? And I guess most of this work has really kind of cycled back to like, yes, they're, they are directionally correct. They do. They, they, they're, they're, uh, those are the, those are the principles. And, mm -hmm. and um, the, the work that, that then, you know, Teal's getting into is like all those, the beneficials and the, and the more detailed work, that's really the future of how to, how to specifically manage for some specific things. Mm -hmm. I agree with Matt about those general principles. I didn't highlight um, in the management practices I showed, but in our field survey, we did see, like we looked at the number of passes um, from fall to spring. And then um, there was a relation, a very, very weak relationship again, because there's so much noise, but let the less tillage you had, the less tillage passes you had, the higher your soil protein values were. So again, it's like, it's really hard to measure these things, but we kind of have this like, you know, common sense idea of like, what to do, but it's like, how do you implement that within your particular operation, right? Like you have your own ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so there's a lot of questions about manure. Um, so maybe, and, and Matt, I know you've done a lot of work on this on the conventional side of things as well, um, but questions about how liquid manure um, applications might differ from um, other, manure via grazing or bedding pack perhaps um, and how if heavy manure could actually decrease soil health particularly perhaps if that was anaerobic liquid manure well I'm, I'm and uh, Teal and Miranda I don't want to uh, if you have any thoughts please uh, I will so here's my thoughts on this and that's it's about the carbon input. So we, when we apply liquid dairy manure, we're not applying a lot of carbon as much obviously as when we're applying solid manure. So it really, if we could ever like balance out that carbon, they're equal, but generally speaking, liquid dairy manure, it's everything's been worked over more, it's more available, it stimulates, get that quick stimulation. Um, but the long-term, you know, there's still, there's some evidence even with long-term use of, of, of the slow building so generally speaking, we tend to think about the composted manure, the solid manures tend to have um, maybe a bigger benefit in terms of uh, maybe long-term soil health building, but it might just simply be based on the fact that we're adding more carbon to the soil with those um, manures. So, um, and it's a slower, they tend to break down a little bit, a little bit slower compared to liquid dairy manure. Uh, in terms of making the soil go anaerobic, I mean, you would have to apply quite a bit and pack it down pretty tight. Um, I, I'm, I'm perhaps uh, person asked the question as a specific. Yeah, I think, um, and again, I don't know if this came up in any of the literature review for this work, um, and maybe this is the way I'm interpreting it, is maybe just the, the suite of microbes that are in an anaerobic dairy manure versus the microbes that may be part of um, a other manure management. Um, and maybe this goes back to the mechanism of why manure benefits is more of the carbon additions than the, the microbes being applied to the soil directly. But is there a difference there as well? Um, and there's a question related to pH too, how pH might drive soil communities. Yeah. I have done quite a bit of literature review on manure effects on microbial communities and soil health. And it is one that's really interesting. It's like 
adding manure is a great resource to have to get carbon, more carbon on your field, to feed the microbes, to build so soil organic matter. That does seem to be great. What's interesting is that in different long-term studies that are specifically interested in testing the effects of manure, we see different microbial species or taxa dominate in these different systems that are probably more about the soil type in the UK experiment versus the Wix experiment we did. But that is one thing that is, is coming out of these data is that you have, even at the, the largest scale that we can look at, the phyla level, there are pretty big differences in who is dominating those communities. So we have a lot of work to, to do if we're going to understand um, which of those are decomposers of which types of materials. Um, and can, is that even, is, is knowing that information gonna get us a little bit further in management recommendations? If it is, it's probably gonna be small. And there is a clarification to that too, which is really helpful. And Matt, this is actually related to a question that came up. I know that you were answering earlier this week on a different topic, but whether that manure could potentially bring in too much nitrogen that would actually more rapidly cycle C. So too much N in the manure burning up the carbon. Um, I, I need to uh, think about this for a second. So, so that, I, I only have a long, complicated answer for that because, so in general, I, the, the, I understand the point, right? If we, yeah. if we add a lot of nitrogen to soil, we stimulate the microbial activity, the microbes then uh, stop becoming nitrogen limited and then can perform more tasks by decomposing more organic matter. So the so the so the trade-off in our agricultural systems is we're also so we're applying the the nitrogen and it and it's feeding the microbes. It also uh, can lead to feeding the plant. So as long as we're getting still a benefit in terms of more, like in a corn system, if you're in, if you're able to increase yields with your input with your nitrogen input, so you are still returning more carbon. You could it could have a net neutral effect. Right, so the, the, the trouble, so, but the, but the overall point is interesting, right? If we're adding nitrogen without carbon, um, there's a negative effect, but sometimes we can get that carbon through that plant process. Um, and that's what we've noticed in, in some systems, uh, as long as we're civil to maintain that. Now, the, the, you know, I'm complimenting, you know, manure quite a bit here in terms of its benefit on the carbon side, but obviously you wanna acknowledge there are some obviously limitations in terms of nitrogen and phosphorus and their effects on the environment with manure that we need to manage. So I would be more concerned about managing for those principles first. I think if we're applying within the realm of, of proper nutrient needs, I think then that's um, beneficial. Going beyond that uh, is probably where bad things happen all around. Yeah, that's an interesting, an interesting question. Um, there's a question related to if, if anyone is, um, uh, any comments on, um, uh, rhizophagy, rhizophagy, why oh, can't I say that word, rhizophagy, <laughs> um, and how that just, I don't, I know that wasn't tested within the scope of this research, but any comments in general? I, <clears throat> my work hasn't been um, at that level of function of the metabolisms of different microbes. So I'm not, I'm not super familiar on how management or anything would affect rhizophagy mm -hmm. or eating of <laughs> roots. All right. Um, so we're at the top of the hour. Um, thank you all for a uh, really uh, informative presentation on, on so many different aspects of um, soil biology and, and soil health, and particularly as it relates to organic grain and, and dairy systems. Um, so with that, um, we- Can I make one final comment, Erin? Oh yeah, of course, Matt. I just, as we wrap this up, just, you know, as you think about those three circles and why soil biology hasn't been incorporated, I, I hopefully this, you know, it's, 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 it's a huge challenge. We've done a lot of work just to, you know, and our main results are now we feel really comfortable that, you know, 
this is the this is the correct direction. And then, but we still need more work by Miranda and Teal, right, to get at those very specific things. And that's going to be the grand challenge for a lot of soil science research, but it's not going to come quickly. But we appreciate everyone's patience. <laughs> it's, it's an exciting area. And there's a lot that we still have to learn, but it's exciting to see this, this research coming out and appreciate the efforts of, of all of you.